Morning, everyone. Uh, here in St. Paul, Minnesota, and to those of you who are watching from a distance, it is in the 30 degrees uh, Fahrenheit and snowing a little bit. So if you are elsewhere in the Ethiopian diaspora, uh, you might be happy uh, this morning that you're watching this in the comfort and warmth uh, of your home. Um, this is uh, the third in a series of conversations uh, inspired uh, by our friend Nagesa Dube and the local Oromo community. And uh, today we're going to hear from uh, people with the Advocates for Human Rights who have been working at the United Nations. And we're also here at a kind of historic moment uh, that Prime Minister Abi has recently been recognized with the Nobel Prize. Um, and uh, I'm sure we have lots of questions about what does that really mean. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to Nagesa, and we will go from there. Thank you, Peter, for a brief introduction. Uh, congratulations to congratulations to uh, all Ethiopians, uh, to friends of Ethiopians, and, I mean, to the world. Uh, our Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed Ali won a Peace Nobel Prize. No, stand up. Yeah, so uh, I would like to con congratulate the Prime Minister, the people of Ethiopia, and the people of the world for the for winning the Nobel Prize. He did a great job. He has tried a lot to restore peace in the region, in Ethiopia, in the between Ethiopia and Eritrea. We lost about uh, 70,000 70, lives in the war between the two countries, and it's a very big achievement to be able to at least restore peace to some extent, even though it's not yet finalized. I mean, peaceful atmosphere is there now. The two countries can, like, people can travel from Eritrea to Ethiopia, and I mean, a friendly relationship has been restored. That's a great achievement, and there are a lot of other achievements he has done. So coming back to the conversation we have today, it's about uh, the role of um, basically the advocates for human rights uh, uh, with regards to, with the effort to uh, respect to respect for human rights and their role at the UN United Nations. Uh, sorry, it's working. Yeah, working. So uh, with that, uh, the advocate has play, played a great role. They have been advocated at, at advocating at. Um, they have been using the United Nations as a tool to to put pressure on the countries so that they would respect human rights. A great advocacy at level of United Nations. So uh, here I have Amy Berquist who worked hard for years, for a decade maybe. Uh, to at uh, internet uh, in, in the international justice program in the advocates for human rights and she has been advocating at uh, UN level she's also a deputy direct she she, she, she has a role in a um, fighting to <laughs> fighting to uh, 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 death penalty and uh, uh, I mean her, uh, she will introduce herself very well. And uh, Judy, Judy, Karadi. Judy Karadi is uh, a volunteer who have been volunteering at UN level to for especially uh, United Periodic Universal Review. She has been presenting. I remember she been presenting Congo, representing Congo and presenting on lobbying on behalf. So we have these great people who have worked a lot at United Nations. Uh, I have been, I traveled with them to Geneva last March. So I know how hard 
and difficult work and how tirelessly they have been working, working hard. Uh, so I will just give them a chance to introduce themselves. Then after that, we'll go to the, 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 the our uh, presentation. So when people ask me what I do, I often say to them, and, and I was having the same feeling on Thursday night when I was over by Target Center in Minneapolis when our president was here to speak, have you ever felt powerless when your government is doing things that you disagree with and you feel like there's no way to change what's going on? And sometimes we feel that here in the United States, and sometimes we feel that uh, people feel that around the world, that they don't have a voice to change what their government is doing, especially in the area of human rights. And my role at the Advocates is to help take the voices of people who are passionate about human rights in their country and bring those voices to the United Nations and to the regional human rights mechanisms so that those bodies can put pressure on their governments to change. And we have, for more than a decade, collaborated with the Aroma community here in Minnesota to put pressure on the Ethiopian government to respect human rights, and we collaborate with partners around the world to do that same thing. So that's my role at the Advocates for Human Rights in our international justice program. It's leveraging these international tools to make sure that their governments will hear the voices of the people, the people who are directly affected. Because a lot of times the governments don't listen directly to the people when the people cry out, when they're out on the streets protesting, when they're on social media. But a lot of governments do listen to the United Nations. And it might not seem like they listen right away, but ultimately, eventually, they listen and the United Nations has influence over those governments and it's a way to amplify the voices of people who have something to say about human rights. So that's my role at the Advocates for Human Rights. We'll talk in more detail in a little bit about how we did this work with respect to Ethiopia, but first I'll let Judy introduce herself. Okay. Uh, my name is Judy Karate. I've been a volunteer with the Advocates for four or five years now. And in that role, I've really fulfilled many different types of um, of uh, activities, uh, starting at working at the front desk um, and just being a receptionist to actually going to the United Nations, advocating for human rights in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and meeting with, you know, I think there were 18 meetings with various delegates from countries who were going to be involved in the, in the per Universal Periodic Review um, for the Congo. So it ranges across all of all issues, but it's something that I fiercely believe in, and um, it's a way for me to be able to to give back in my retirement, <laughs> and very fulfilling. Thank you, Thank you both for for brief introduction. Um, so I will also turn uh, to Emmy to make the presentation sure. happen. Yeah, um, and I want to, I, I'm glad that I guess it brought up the Nobel Peace Prize because that was something that people were really excited about. But one thing that people aren't noticing is that the Peace Prize was not awarded only to Dr. Abiy Ahmed. When the Norwegian Nobel Prize Committee made its announcement, it's, it's in the, the very second sentence of the announcement, says the prize is also meant to recognize all the stakeholders working for peace and reconciliation in Ethiopia and in the East and Northeast African regions. Not just for Dr. Ahmed, but also for all the stakeholders working for peace and reconciliation. So I think that includes all of you here who have been working so tirelessly for all these years to promote peace in Ethiopia and to promote reconciliation. One of the things I want to make sure we talk about here today, though, when we talk about peace and re reconciliation, there's often a third piece that gets forgotten about. And we can't we can't blame the Nobel Peace Prize Committee for forgetting about this because they're, they have peace in their name, so they're going to promote peace and reconciliation, but accountability is a really important part of the process that Ethiopia needs to go through and other countries need to go through. It's not just about reconciling and forgiving and achieving peace, but making sure that there's accountability for past human rights violations and ongoing human rights violations. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and I know that not everyone is happy about the Nobel Peace Prize, and the, the Nobel Committee acknowledged this. 
that um, the committee has said that um, no doubt some people will think this year's prize is being awarded too early, that things are still a lot of conflict in Ethiopia, it's not peaceful, uh, and the committee says it believes that it is now that Abiy Ahmed's efforts deserve recognition and need encouragement, meaning there's much more to be done. And the committee even acknowledged that ethnic strife in Ethiopia continues to escalate. We've seen troubling examples of this in recent weeks and months. So the committee is well aware that Ethiopia is not peaceful, that there continue to be ethnic clashes and <coughs> conflict in Ethiopia, but they wanted to press the Prime Minister of Ethiopia to go forward to do more. Um, and so this is seen as a sign of encouragement, not a stamp of approval that everything is great in Ethiopia. So I think it's really important. I, I encourage you all to read the full statement by the Nobel Prize Committee. It's really quite thoughtful and um, acknowledges that there's still much work that needs to be done. So in talking about what we have done and what we hope to do in the future, I first want to acknowledge that all of this is in partnership with um, the communities that are directly affected. People like Nagesu who have had to flee Ethiopia because of human rights violations, um, and people who are still in Ethiopia fighting to work toward human rights, uh, working with the diaspora communities here in, in Minnesota and around the world as well. And it's something we've been doing for many years. And we always say that the fight for human rights is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Um, and so this is part of the marathon. We're not finished with it. We're still running, but I feel like if, if you've ever run a marathon, they talk about hitting that wall at about mile 16 or 20. I forget where exactly it is, but I think we've come, we, we've come across that wall. We, we've passed through that wall, and we're now getting a second wind in Ethiopia, and we're continuing to move forward. So what is it that we have been doing lately? And this is just one piece of our overall advocacy, but what have we been doing lately on Ethiopia that gives us hope and gives us a, an idea of a path forward? What I want to talk about is something that we've been working on um, roughly for, for about a year and a half. Um, and that is a procedure at the United Nations called the Universal Periodic Review. If you follow Nagesa on Facebook, I'm sure you've heard of the UPR before because <laughs> He's very vocal about that, and that's one thing we've been very busy with. Um, and the UPR, Universal Periodic Review, as the name suggests, is a review at the United Nations that's universal. All countries in the world go through this process. Um, it's periodic, it happens every five years, and it's a review of human rights in the particular country. So the last time we did this UPR in Ethiopia was in 2014. And if you follow the history of Ethiopia, you know 2014 was really a landmark year, not necessarily in a good way. This is when the student protests really um, expanded and the government cracked down on student protests. People were killed, people were detained, people were tortured. <coughs> Things were in a really uh, troubling state in 2014 when, when Ethiopia had its second UPR. And then we fast forward to 2019, five years later, this is the next cycle of the UPR. So it, had, it gave us a chance, it gave everyone a chance to assess where Ethiopia was in 2014 and what progress it's made since, that 20, since 2014 and where will we go for the next five years with Ethiopia. So what the UPR does, and this is similar to a lot of different human rights processes at the United Nations and with the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, is the people who are going to focus on human rights in Ethiopia, they need information. They need to know what's going on in the ground, on the ground. If you think back to 2014 in Ethiopia, information was really hard to find. It was really hard to get because Ethiopia did not have free and independent media, journalism, internet was restricted, and so it was really hard to get information. But one of our jobs is to find that information, get that information, and then get it in the hands of the people at the UN who could put pressure on the government of Ethiopia. So how do we do that? We call this fact-finding. And we do fact-finding through our clients and former clients who have come from Ethiopia and can tell us directly what happened to them, what they saw happening, what's happened to their family members. Also other people in the diaspora who have direct contacts with friends and family members back home who say this is what's happening. And to the extent that people were able to, from Ethiopia, share information with us, we would take that information directly from people in Ethiopia who could, who could tell us what's really happening on the ground. So we did, did this fact-finding process back in 2014. We did it again for the report that we submitted in 2018 for this review. 
But the facts are really like gold at the United Nations. Because the people who want to have influence over Ethiopia, they need to know what's going on, and they can't find out that information on their own. They depend on organizations like the Advocates for Human Rights and diaspora organizations to give them credible information about what's actually happening. So that's a really important role, a part of our role, and so the first thing we do is start with fact-finding. If you picked up the handouts in the back, you may have seen our one-pagers, and I guess it is hold, holding one of them. This is a, a condensation of probably a 10 to 15 page report that we published. We actually published two different reports, one on women's rights and gender-based violence, one on civil and political rights in Ethiopia. But that's, those reports include all the facts that we gathered with the help of people like Nagesa, um, people like our clients, and people who are in Ethiopia, giving us information about what's happened since 2014 in Ethiopia in different areas of human rights. So we published that, uh, that all in a report. That report was due in October of 2018, so about one year ago. And that sort of begins the active part of the UPR process. So we submitted the report, and then um, we condensed the reports into one-pagers, and Judy's going to talk about that. And then we had to figure out which countries to lobby. And are you going to talk about that, Judy? Or yes. you, okay, so we have to figure out which countries to lobby. And then we did our lobbying, both electronically and, by, and in person with meetings. And then what happened in March, or in March we were there in Geneva, and then in May, the government of Ethiopia sent a delegation to Geneva to meet with all the countries of the world and to receive recommendations. And when, when I take the floor back from Judy, I'll talk about what those recommendations were and where we go with them. But I'll let Judy now take the floor to talk a little bit about what our process is to try to influence the government of Ethiopia and every other government in the world, because this applies equally to every country, um, to try to get them to raise important human rights issues in the context of this UPR, Universal Juridic Review. Yeah, yeah, Thank you, Amy. Nice job summarizing some of the background for what we do. Um, I was trying to think of an example that would be most meaningful to the audience about what the UPR really is. And from a personal standpoint, it's very much like a job performance review. Um, as you have probably done in the past, you sit down with your boss maybe once a year and they give you an evaluation. They look at your last performance review. What were your goals? Did you meet those goals? Uh, what have you been doing well? And uh, always makes us a little nervous. What can you do to improve your performance? Uh, and then how should you go about that? So that's really what the UPR is, plain and simple. The difference is that in the UPR, the evaluators are not one person. They are human rights delegates from every nation who is a member of the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva. So our job as we arrive, Amy talked about some of the tools that we use, our job is to find the right person, find out who is sympathetic to Ethiopia's human rights situation, and is going to consider it a priority because they are a bit judicious about who they choose. You know, they've got political considerations sometimes in their own countries, um, but who is going to be able to speak out and spend their political capital supporting a country like Ethiopia? So. I'll, at the end of this, I will talk about, uh, expand on what Amy talked about, about why this really matters and how it makes a difference in the world. So the key thing that we're trying to do is trying to get United Nations delegates to make specific recommendations, we even word those recommendations for them, in the reports and the, the material that they submit at the end of the review. So. We do three things to get ready for this trip. The first is we prepare a stakeholder report. Now, not every nonprofit or NGO, as we call them, can submit a stakeholder report to the United Nations. The Advocates for Human Rights has a special status with the United Nations, has for many years. So when we partner with Negesa and United Roma Voices, when our report goes in, it is actually read by the UN people and they take recommendations from our report and publish them for everybody to read as a preliminary discussion of what is going on in, say, Ethiopia. So to give you two examples 
of statements that we made in our first report that were published for the entire UN, one of them was about the anti-terrorism law in Ethiopia, which was being abused and used to suppress journalists and the press and the media, and also the opposition party and dis voices of dissent. So we pointed out very clearly that that law had to be enforced properly. And another example of what we did was in regard to the U rule of law and the judiciary system. We said that tri many trials were not held fairly. There was no immediate presumption of innocence of the defendant. And there were many, many unlawful detentions. So those were two examples that we had put in the report that they actually published so the world could see. <coughs> so that's a lot of work. That's probably our biggest task. Amy talked about the one-pagers. And UN delegates from these many, many countries are very busy. They are inundated by every human rights advocacy organization that goes to the UN. So you're going to get your point across if it's easy to read, easy to follow, easy to understand. So that's why we prepare these. And we email them to the mission of, say, Switzerland or the United States or Mexico, anyone who has a chance to weigh in on Ethiopia. So they'll at least have seen our name before we arrive. And we have the issues summarized very concisely, including the recommendations, which you'll see at the bottom. Um, and then with the group that's going to the UN with us, who are people from all over the US, as well as our partners from around the world. Um, we had someone from Albania, Russia, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, um, and a number of others that we um, we met with and, and prepared for this presentation. Um, so your topic will either be Ethiopia, like yeah. Megesa, uh, mindless Congo, um, or you may be like Amy, where you're representing many countries and you're an expert on the death penalty or women's rights. So we do a lot of preparation with that. When we arrive in Geneva, we take one full day before the session starts, and we all meet each other and we rehearse where Amy pretends to be the delegate from Switzerland, and I'm trying to sell her on having a meeting with us to hear about Ethiopia and Albania, for instance. Um, the actual meetings themselves is what we spend most of our time on. Um, I'll come back to that. We also do what we call side events, where Nagesa and I were on a panel. I think you were there as well, Amy. Um, and we talk about whatever our prepared text is. And people can come to this, and they can come and go if they don't have time to sit through a whole meeting. They can come to hear what we have to say about the various country human rights issues. But what we do in order to get these meetings, which as Amy said, the information is the gold standard, is we actually go down on the United Nations floor and we'll see based on, you know, let's say, uh, United States, we'll go tap them on the shoulder. Hi, this is my name. I am a volunteer for the Advocates for Human Rights. And what we have with us is we have the prior recommendations that all these countries have made that match up what we want to get done for Ethiopia, for instance. So if Switzerland made a very strong recommendation uh, to improve the enforcement, the correct enforcement of the anti-terrorism law. In Ethiopia, in the last report, we will say to them, oh, I see that four years ago you were very strong about this anti-terrorism law. And they'll go, really? <laughs> they may be new to their job, and they haven't had time to do this research yet. And we will then hold up our one-pager and say, Oh yes, we've got a lot of information here, and we also know that you recommended this at the last review. So they all of a sudden think, boy, I can save a lot of time and research if I meet with these people for 15 minutes and hear about what's going on in Ethiopia, so that when I have to write my report, I've got the documentation already done. I don't have to do the research. So um, last, on our last trip there, we had a great amount of success. I think we had some of the highest totals for actual meetings that we've ever had because um, there were some countries that were up for, people were very interested in Ethiopia, people were very interested in the DRC. 
Um, and they have to decide, you know, some of the delegates will say, you know, my country is really doing very well in that area, so I don't know if I'll be able to make a recommendation because they have the politics of it as well. But if we can give them the right information, these recommendations um, are really all, the, they're the main reason that we go on this trip. And let me tell you why they're important, sort of in, in conclusion. Regardless of whether a country has good leadership or very bad leadership, economic prosperity is what every leader wants because it will keep the protests down. Maybe they have good intentions and they want to make the country better, or maybe they want to stay out of the news and not be called a human rights violator on the world stage. So when these reports are finally written, the international press is there. There's a whole press gallery in the back of the room. And the individual that's sitting for Ethiopia is surrounded by hundreds of people who are the human rights uh, delegates from all the other nations. And they will read the report in front of everybody that's on television. It's a big deal. So if they are accused of serious human rights violations, in this report, the leadership is going to suffer some real consequences. Uh, number one, is a global business going to want to put their money into Ethiopia and build a manufacturing plant when there's peril involved and there's unrest and it's going the wrong direction? Number two, are the world banks going to want to loan money to Ethiopia if there's going to be unrest and human rights violations? Those are really, really big issues. But the biggest of all is, to me, economic sanctions. You know, the U.S. has sanctions on Iran right now. And it's stifling the government. Even if the leaders want the money for the wrong reason <laughs> as opposed to for the people, if they're not getting trade, if people aren't allowed to travel to their country, no tourism, people think it's too dangerous, what a business, a bank, or the UN will do is they will go to these reports and see are you following our recommendations or are you continuing to abuse human rights. So that, to me, is the most important effect that our work has, and I'm very proud to participate in it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. uh, I'll also say a little bit in the room of our audiences, I mean, online live followers. So, um, yeah, already uh, Amy and Judy uh, mentioned that universal credit review is one of the most important to most important uh, program in which the advocates present. So we had the universal credit review every five years. Uh, there was one in 2014 and in 2019 again. So next to this, Amy will be talking about the activities and lobbying effects. And in 2019, there was a we have done lobbying for universal credit review, especially with regards to Ethiopia. And then uh, countries we lobbied in the review have had a lot of recommendation for Ethiopia. The Ethiopian government has also responded to those recommendations in September. So uh, the whole thing would, would be presented by Emi. Uh, I will say a little bit in Oromo. Kanafu ammarat ti wani irat hasaj bukuni irajala sader kamu tu magam tu manisit jarmian advocates for human rights jadi bukuni mirga ala nama ilah cise video ada dadif gawas ada damu tu magam tu manis esa gawas asan kesa di Ethiopia akasumal le orang mula cise jarmian bukuni yero yero esa jer isa kesa saganta tu magam tu man Irrati kau pakai okay, sa toko. Mungkin ala nama lain sih saya wujudkan shani ka toa tanuce. Toa nama mungkin ala nama mama United Nations ka kopes United Nations Human Rights Council kaje dalam abadeh je tu. Mungkin magam tu manjalat. Akademi tu kote abadeh wujudkan shani Universal Credit Review. Yo kan mau toa nama mungkin ala nama mama tapi iya mara. Jadi ama biji mati wujudkan shani why Ethiopia? Ethiopia is not only for that. Ethiopia is the biggest in the world. It 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 is
jarmiyalena dadda wa etopia qara bakka buqota biyo sanatitti e wonni kenni biyi tun wara ko kana qaddira ko kana qad gabaasa kenni gabaasa kana ra hundawani biyi hundulu etopia bakka buwa etopia de ra ko kana qabdan dubarti milga dubarti ra kana qabdan e milga alla marra milga mirgota dadda irratti ra ko kana tijira kid amarra kana jira jedaniitu yesu etu ajandan to ko mo fakena argentina yo jedam wa e argentina bi di ba sagalta mi sadan sun bi di marra qaddo ju ratti yada kan nufe tun dunu yada kan nite bi yi sun bo yada kan gurate debi es e ju mo magam to mani kana to kuma la ma fu afu go ame ture yero kuma la ma fu afu go ame ti advocate for human right yero sani barato to romo ambora pinchilla ka e bi ya guta ke sa sochi tu isa ke sa gal chani de sani tu yero sani yada tan tu itari ra farratti fi woni ra tu do fature eh isan biye heddu fu wan ergani fi biye heddu ni yada kan ni tetu te chu to ka ra recommendation kan ni tetu te akuma san eh kuma la ma fu sa galin le bechu barakan eh diate eh kara gabas ko paye biye ergam chu ko ko ta biye daddati eh kana fu to ka ratti eh biye di ba olit yada ke mirga du parti ratti kasuma civil and political right mirga siyasati ke democracy irratti baju ila alchi se bi yeddu bi gabasa san argat ya de heddu kan ni tejir ta actually yero kun yero haga to ko jira mi to ake sat ku ferratti le taatu ful dura mal go ro gabda wanje dura ya de heddu kan name ya de san gurate to kalle de bi kan ni tejir ti chu e to kan ka ya te ji amay yo pani mo manje na pa ke na me agiye agiye am agiye am sa ya ji ya am sa kesa eh woni to ya yo santure da bare ni to ya yo santure ba ko bo ti to ya eh it ana woni general prosecutor general gadi on na miti ya dam ba it ana ma abuka woni ana ana kamen ki ha nam isatu woni ka bare ke chu jilla ko ko wate dake eh recommendation ni go ame hun da fu ate galani debi ammo ji a full bana kana kesa debi kana ni jirani debi sani jirani isala ji se emin gabasa buta wan ka duf eh gabasa buta isira dage na ya wa fa english eti ti fu fai chu amari kenna ka ti fu fu ta eh would we have a light break and get back to it or uh the for you is your is your group what do you think Listen. Listen. Yeah, yeah. Let's continue. So, yep. All right. Great. So, Judy, and I guess I give you a good overview of where we are, and now I want to talk about what happened on the 14th of May, 2019, and then what happened last month, September, at the UN, because it's a really big event. So, the 14th of May. Um, was the interactive dialogue with the government of Ethiopia. The government of Ethiopia, I think, sent about 12 people to Geneva to represent the government, to respond to questions, and to hear recommendations from governments around the world. So the total number of um, countries that made recommendations, there were 132 countries that made recommendations to Ethiopia and the total number of recommendations, because sometimes governments will make more than one recommendation. So the Ethiopia received 327 recommendations. That's quite a lot of attention Ethiopia was receiving, and I think it's more than the last time around because people were more, governments are more optimistic because they'd seen progress, they had seen some improvements, and they really want to press Ethiopia to go farther, to say you've done some good steps so far and now you can do more. So, what we're going to do now is take a look at some of these recommendations and then what happened to the recommendations. Because one of the things we haven't talked about yet for the UPR, and one thing that makes it unique among the UN human rights mechanisms, is the government that receives the recommendations has a choice. They get to decide whether they accept or reject the recommendation. So they can, they can look at that list of 327 recommendations and reject all of them and say, we, we will not do those. And in 2014, the government rejected a lot of recommendations. But this time around, the government of Ethiopia re accepted a lot of the recommendations. In fact, they accepted 270 of the recommendations they received. So not perfect, they didn't accept everything, but it is their choice. They have the choice to accept or reject recommendations, but they accepted 270 of them, and that's what happened in September. And this doesn't mean, okay, the UPR is done, 
the Ethiopian government accepted recommendations. Now is the hard part, because the hard part is now that Ethiopia has accepted recommendations, they have until 2024 to implement them. So this is where the hardest work happens is between now, so you know, from September of 2019 to 2024, the government has a lot of work it's committed to do. It promised in front of the whole world to do 270 things. And it's up to the government, but not just the government, but all of us to make sure that the government can and does do all of those things. Because the government can't do it alone. The government needs help and support from civil society, from other governments in the world, to do all the things it promised to do. But the promise is an important first step. Because we didn't get a lot of promises five years ago in 2014. The government didn't promise to do very much, and even the things it promised to do, it didn't really do. But now the government has made, we believe in good faith, has made promises and commitments to the world. And our job is to help the government do its job, do what it promised to do. And that's really exciting, but it's also a big task. And I think all of us, all of us here in this room and everyone listening, we all have a role to play to help the government keep its promises. To say, okay, you promised to do this, now let's work together to make it happen. And if we can do that, then things are gonna be a lot better in 2024. And another really nice thing, and it's just by coincidence, um, how often does Ethiopia have presidential election or its major elections? It's every five years. Every five years, the yep. same as the UPR, right? Yep. yep. The UPR is every five years, the major elections are every five years, and the UPR is always one year right before. So Ethiopia's next elections are in 2020, yeah. next year, same yeah. as the United States. Uh, but every time the UPR happens, it's always a year before the elections, and I think people are really concerned and also maybe a little optimistic about the elections next year. But there are a lot of recommendations you'll see that are about the elections making sure that everything is peaceful, everything is fair, so that when those elections happen, there's better representation at all levels of government in Ethiopia. And then in 2024, it'll again be right before the 2025 elections in Ethiopia. So that's a nice, a nice coincidence, but it's also a great time to get the government to commit to doing things about elections, to make sure that they're free and fair, um, because it's right before they happen. So that's probably the most pressing timeline for these recommendations are the ones that are related to the 2020 elections. Those elections are right around the corner. What time of year did they happen? Are they in May? May. Yeah. Mostly. So that's really fast. You know, that's that's soon. And there's a lot of there are a lot of recommendations we'll see that have to do with those, those elections, and they need to be implemented right away, ASAP. But there are also a lot of other recommendations we'll take a look at that the government has five years to do it, and then the government is going to be back in the hot seat in Geneva in May of 2024, responding to questions and receiving new recommendations. And you can bet that in March of 2024, we're gonna be there meeting with governments of the world to say, here's what's happened. Thank you for making a recommendation, and now we want you to make these additional recommendations. Because things aren't perfect, they're not perfect in any country, but we'll always want Ethiopia to get better, to continue to respect human rights, to improve its respect for human rights, and to push for peace and accountability and um, reconciliation, of course. But we hope to see progress in five years. So let's take a look at what we had. And for those of you who are in the room, we have this handout that looks like this. This is sort of a typical official UN document, except for I edited it a bit. And I don't like to edit, but it was a very long document. And so I just included in the document the, the key takeaways, which are the recommendations that Ethiopia received. So this document includes all 327 recommendations that Ethiopia received from all those governments in the world, all 132 governments. Um, and this is called the Report of the Working Group. So this was the document that was, that, that was based on what the governments actually said on the 14th of May, 2019. Uh, and you, what you'll see is, um, like all UN documents, they have paragraph numbers. And the most important paragraph in this document is paragraph 163. Paragraph 163 is all the recommendations Ethiopia received, and it's broken down into subparagraphs, point one, point two, et cetera. These are all of the recommendations. So you'll see this is the exact text of what all the different governments said to Ethiopia, and you'll see after each recommendation in parentheses is the name of the country that made the recommendation. So that's how you can sort of understand this document. You'll see each subparagraph has what they said on the floor of the United Nations on the 14th of May, and then the country that said that recommendation. 
So these are all the recommendations. They're kind of organized by topic. So for example, we were talking about the elections. If you want to see the, the recommendations related to the 2020 elections, we can start with um, 163.88. It's at the very bottom of one of the pages. So if you go down to 0.88, you'll see a recommendation from Czechia, also known as the Czech Republic. And Czechia said that the government of Ethiopia should finalize the revision of the electoral law in view of the 2020 general elections and focus on equal participation of all citizens. So that was a recommendation from Czechia. You'll also see there are more election recommendations further along. Let me find more. They kind of stick out because a lot of them say 2020. They're very specific to the 2020 election. we have more because I remember reading through them just this morning but they're um, but at any rate they're they're there are, there are more on 204 204 thank you a new, a new way to have some help exactly yes so starting with 204 205 206 <coughs> that whole section has to do with the 2020 elections and um, there are different countries that made those recommendations Namibia France Japan um, Switzerland, they're all making recommendations about the 2020 elections. Now, one of the things that I've done to this document, this document didn't initially have the yellow on it. The recommendations highlighted are in yellow are the recommendations the government of Ethiopia accepted. The government of Ethiopia promised to do every single thing in this document that's highlighted in yellow. And you'll notice it's mostly yellow. They made a lot of promises. And of course, politicians like to make promises, right? That's kind of what they're paid to do. They want to make people happy. They make all sorts of promises. So our job now is to turn those promises into reality. And that's the hard work, is changing from promises to reality. But I think there's a real role for a lot of us to play. And I want to give you some examples. So if you take a look, for example, one of, one of, I think is the only recommendation to mention Aromia or the Aroma people is 203. It's at the very bottom of the previous page and then the one we were just looking at. And this is a recommendation from Mexico. And again, it's yellow. The government promised to do this. The government promised to investigate and punish human rights violations which had occurred in various regions, in particular Amhara and Aromia, addressing various ethnic, social, economic, and political dimensions. So to think about what the government promised to do there, and they had the choice, they didn't have to do this, but they promised to do this. They promised to investigate and punish human rights violations that occurred in Aromia. That's a big promise, investigate and punish. So what should the people in Aromia be doing right now? Hey, you made this promise. Mexico recommended you do this, and you made this promise. Just in September of 2019, you promised to investigate and punish. What steps are you taking? So if people have firsthand information about those human rights violations, they should be going to the authorities and the, of the government of Ethiopia to say, here is information. You need to do an investigation. We are going to help you with your investigation, because you promised to do it. So we are here to help you investigate. We are here, we will bring witnesses to come and testify. We will show you photographs. We will show you videos that were posted on Facebook. Here, we're helping you with your investigation because you have to do it. You promised to do it. So here we are to help you with your investigation. And then the next part is the punishment. So you need to be able to identify the people who were responsible and of course, give them a fair trial, give them due process. But then if they are found guilty of human rights violation, they need to be punished. And, and the government of Ethiopia agreed. They agreed to punish people for the human rights violations that happened in Aromia. So it's, it shouldn't just be empty words. There's hard work to be done. And so that investigation of the human rights violations in Ethiopia could take a long time. But start with a small piece of it. Start with, for example, the 2014 student protests, where students were killed, um, arrested, expelled from school. Can that be investigated? Is that something the Ethiopian government has the authority to investigate? And do people have evidence that could be used in that investigation? Yeah. 
So it's up to the people, civil society, individuals, including those in Ethiopia and also people outside of Ethiopia, because some people fled that violence. So some people are in camps in, in Kenya, some people are here in the United States and around the world. They have information that can help that investigation. And they should be getting, uh, coming forward to share that, that information so that the investigation can be full and fair, and so that then the human rights violators can be punished. So that's one example of what can be done and what tremendous work there is in front of us between now and 2024. Because that in, those investigations need to happen and that punishment needs to happen by 2024. But you can see how it's a good leverage, a good tool to leverage with the government to say, you know, we're not just here complaining about human rights violations. We're here to help you do your job. We're here to help the prime minister keep his promise that he made in September 2019 to do this so that when he comes back in 2024, he can say, here are the steps that we've taken. Here's what we've done. Here are the investigations we've, we've, we've pursued. And here are the trials, and here are the people who have been held accountable, who have been punished for their actions. So that's a really big step, I think. And you know, it, it's specifically um, encouraging that Mexico mentioned Aromia, because we know a lot of people feel really strongly about what's, what's happened not just in 2014, but 2014 to the present, the human rights violations are there. And so that's, that's a great commitment that has been made. Um, if you look on the same page and look up a little bit to point 198, this is a recommendation from the United States. And Judy mentioned, you know, we would look for the United States and, and meet with them. We did email the United States, but the United States was not present in the room to be lobbied. But we know that emailing works. We know that they get our information even if we just send it by email, because the United States has several really strong recommendations to help press for human rights in Ethiopia. So, and the United States has a lot of influence, like it or not, and it was nice for us to see, we were, we were kind of scared that maybe the United States wouldn't care about human rights in Ethiopia, but they made a good recommendation to hold accountable security forces that commit human rights violations. So remember, it's not just about peace, it's not just about reconciliation. Accountability is, that important, is another important piece of it. And the United States made this recommendation to make sure the security forces, in other words, those people who were shooting at the peaceful protesters in Ethiopia, that they are held accountable. And the government of Ethiopia had a choice to accept it or not. And they accepted that recommendation. They said, yes, we will hold accountable. So it's not, I mean, one of the things you, we talk about, and if you look at our one pager, one of the things we were concerned about, and Magessa and Judy raised this issue with the people with countries we lobbied, is the government's rhetoric, government's rhetoric supports forgiveness without accountability. Because at the time, the prime minister was talking about the need to forgive, the need to move forward, and we were really afraid that the government wouldn't embrace the need for accountability. But the fact that the government of the United States made that recommendation and that the government of Ethiopia accepted that recommendation really shows that they, they were put, there was pressure put on the government of Ethiopia and the government of Ethiopia embraced it. They said, we're not gonna run away from, from accountability. We do agree that accountability is an important part of moving forward for Ethiopia. So that was another really important piece um, to see. Another thing I wanted to point out, and this has to do with something Judy was talking about. If you turn to recommendation 113. Now, and I know that the issue of multinational, international businesses operating in Ethiopia may be controversial because some of them themselves violate human rights. There are some abusive businesses that will take land away from farmers, for example, um, that will do other things that actually involve human rights violations. So one of the things I was really happy to see as a recommendation and as an accepted recommendation was 113, a recommendation from Norway. Norway recommended, and Ethiopia agreed to do this, to said that Ethiopia should develop a national action plan for the implementation of the guiding principles on business and human rights. Now the guiding principles on business and human rights is this long detailed set of principles about how, what the role of business is in respecting human rights. And developing a national action plan to implement that means that the government of Ethiopia thinks it's important that businesses that do business in Ethiopia need to respect human rights. 
And not just that they need to do that, there needs to be a national action plan. In other words, it needs to be something that the administration sets forth as a plan. Here's what we're going to do, here are the policies, and here's how we're going to achieve them. So they're committed to doing that, and they need to do that by 2024. So organizations like the Advocates for Human Rights, who know about the guiding principles on business and human rights, can offer to work with the government to say, okay, you've agreed to do this. We actually have experts at the University of Minnesota Law School on these guiding <laughs> principles. Here, we can work with you to develop this action plan. And we can give you advice about how to do it. So there's a role for civil society to play. There's a role for individuals to play. There's a role for non-governmental organizations to play. Another thing I want to talk about, and it was an issue that we have heard from our clients and other people we interviewed for our reports, is violence against women. Um, we had a lot of great recommendations that were made on violence against women. In particular, one of the things, if you look at our one pager on violence against women, one of the things we um, recommended was uh, to develop and enforce comprehensive laws addressing all forms of gender-based violence, increasing penalties for domestic violence, acid attacks, gang rape, and marital rape, with functioning oversight and accountability mechanisms. So we wanted to make sure that there were comprehensive laws to address violence against women. And if you look through the recommendations, there are two different sections that address violence against women, and I'll point you in the right direction in just a moment. Um, so if you look at <coughs> recommendation 64 from Iceland, Iceland recommended that Ethiopia review laws from a gender perspective and adopt a comprehensive law on gender-based violence that would include all forms of violence against women. That's almost, almost exactly what we were recommending, and we met with Iceland. So it's really exciting because we, we met with the government of Iceland, we said here's the issue, here are the issues related to violence against women, and then Iceland took the floor on the 14th of May, made this recommendation, and not only did they make the recommendation, the government of Ethiopia accepted it. That's why it's highlighted in yellow. So now the government of Ethiopia has committed to uh, adopting a comprehensive law on gender-based violence. They have to adopt a law between now and 2024. And you know what? The Advocates for Human Rights has a lot of expertise on laws related to gender-based violence. We've advised governments around the world and NGOs around the world about what best practices are and what best laws are to address gender-based violence. So here we, we stand ready. Anyone in the Ethiopian government, if you're listening, we would love to advise you about those laws and what laws you should adopt. Because you've made your promise, you've made your promise to the world and the government of Iceland, and we're ready to help. Another issue where, where we can be available to help is training. So a lot of these recommendations include training for police and security forces on the respect for human rights. Well, the Advocates for Human Rights and other NGOs have provided that training before. We've brought police officers to other countries to train their police officer peers about respecting human rights in the work that they do. And that's something where the Ethiopian government shouldn't have to do it on its own. They should be able to reach out to other countries and to NGOs to help them keep their promises where they committed to um, doing training for security forces, for other government operatives, for police, police officers, they committed to doing this training, they need to have help doing the training. And we stand ready. So that's another aspect of work that, um, that we can all help with. Another example has to do with detention centers. And I know this is, a, a, unfortunately, something Nagisa has had experience with is um, human rights violations in detention centers. If you look at recommendation 72, a recommendation from the Seychelles, was to strengthen the national legal framework to ensure the prevention of and accountability for violations of human rights in detention centers. So preventing human rights violations in detention <coughs> centers, and that might include having reporting systems, having video cameras in any interrogation rooms, um, making sure that there are visits from the International Red Cross to go in and, and have private meetings with prisoners to make sure that they are being treated respectfully. Um, but also accountability again, accountability for violations of human rights in, in detention centers. So are the people being held accountable, do you know, Nagesa, for the people who violated human rights? Not yet. Not yet. So that needs to happen, and it needs to happen by 2024. So how yeah. is that going to happen? The people have to put pressure on the government mm -hmm. so that the government would uh, implement, enforce their mm -hmm. its promise. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And it may mean the government, they say, we don't have the information. Well, do you have some information to guess it? Do you know who needs to be held accountable? 
We have. Can you give yes. them names? Can you yes. give them descriptions? Yes. Yeah. So getting that information in the hands of the government to say, look, you made a promise to hold these people accountable for human rights violations in detention centers. Here are some people who tortured people who have had to flee Ethiopia because it wasn't safe for them. These, here are the names. Here's the information. Here's the evidence. I guess I'm sure we'd be happy to go to Ethiopia and testify. Yes. To right. give sworn testimony about what happened to him and who did it. So that there can be accountability for these human rights violations that happen in detention centers. So there's a lot more here that we can talk about, but my goal is really to get you to start thinking about what the promises are Ethiopia made in September 2019, and what our role is between now and 2024 when Ethiopia has its next universal periodic review. Because it's really quite powerful that the government made its promises but we need to make sure that they're not just making empty promises like a lot of politicians do. We need to make sure that these promises become reality and that's why we're here today. So I invite discussion about it if there are particular topics you want to talk about uh, or if you want more information. What, what, what do you think is the best way to proceed with this? Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, we will have a break right now for uh, 10 minutes. Then we'll, have, we'll come back here and discuss. Great. Yeah, question and answers. Super. That way we can we'll finalize. Here we will have a break.